And the Democrats and Republicans are so proud of the way that they manipulate American democracy that they are ready to ship it to all other nations, right? That's, that's what happens when you privatize democracy. You, you start packaging it, you know? Maybe Banana Republic isn't just about selling boring ass shirts to boring ass people, but also boring ass elections to countries that don't fucking need it. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Uh, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Uh, just a quick note before we di dive into this episode. This was recorded in front of a live virtual audience via Zoom. And if you want to be part of the virtual live stand-up comedy shows, you totally can. Uh, tickets are available for these shows right now. They are in the description below. They're happening on Friday nights. They're happening Friday nights. Uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. They're $5 tickets, and each week uh, is new material, so you can get multiple different uh, tickets for multiple different shows. And not only that, but we also help a grassroots organization or a grassroots venue, activist or journalist, uh, because uh, we all got to take care of each other. So uh, each week is a different uh, grassroots organization for this show the show that you're about to watch we donated half of our ticket sales to a movement for a people's party uh, who are actively working to organize to essentially make a a movement for a people's party you create a, a party that is more representative of the people than corporations and uh, they're they're awesome uh, I've had Nick Branna one of the founders on the show on my uh, interview podcast taboo table talk several different times he's fantastic uh, so uh, if you want to donate to them if you want to learn more about them uh, peoplesparty.org you can find the link in the description below if you want to attend them, like I said, there's tickets uh, to these live virtual stand-up comedy shows. But if you want a free ticket, you can become a sustaining member. You can become a sustaining member right at krishmohan.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N.com. You can become a sustaining member directly on my website through Patreon or via Bandcamp. Through this, you get free tickets to these live virtual stand-up comedy shows. You, you get uh, uh, un unreleased exclusive stand-up comedy and storytelling material. You get uh, bonus merch, uh, and you get early access to larger full episodes of Fork Full of Noodles, like this one that you're watching right now. Uh, so go to krishmohan.com, check out those future dates, and I hope to see you at a show. And now, without any further ado, so let's start here. Uh, so it's election year in the United States. You know what that means. That means a lot of people are going to be yelling on social media about how if you don't vote for their candidate of choice, you're probably just as bad as Hitler. <laughs> and, and, and we should probably cancel you as a person. All right, and this year, yeah, yeah and this year the yeah. contention is at an all time high, right? There are some folks that believe the only way to move forward is voting blue no matter who, right? And this is just a, the people's desperate attempt to get Trump out of the White House, right? This is the establishment Democrats' desperate attempt to keep gaslighting the American people into thinking that they are the party of morality. Look, here's the reality. Voting blue no matter who is not going to fix things, right? Donald J. Trump didn't create racism. He does use it for his advantage because he's the representative of a broken system. The same broken system that Joe Biden is a part of. Same broken system that has both parties gleefully practicing discrimination of all kinds, right? Lest we forget that the queen of the warmongers and democratic high priestess Hillary Clinton, she did call black kids super predators and was against gay marriage. 
Democrats have signed tough on crime bills, which disproportionately put black people in prison. Uh, and Barack Obama, AKA King progressive neoliberal, which super gross statement to say out loud, if you're wondering, uh, very gross. Uh, he deported more immigrants than his Republican predecessors. And this isn't an ex excuse to let Republicans off the hook, right? They're just more blatant with their ignorance and dislike for civil rights. It's like going to see a band you like, you know, you know they're going to play the hits and the Republicans consistently play the hits of homophobia and racism and just a dash of anti-socialism. Just a little bit, just not a lot, you know, just a small amount. And the Democrats are pretending like they have new songs, but then wind up just playing the same hits. And, and then you realize that most of their band is just from the Republicans' band. <laughs> so, yeah. so in reality, the Democrats are just like a Republican cover band. <laughs> Which is gotta gross. play those hits. <laughs> gotta play the hits. <laughs> gotta play those hits. <laughs> it's what we want, baby. <laughs> Don't try the new stuff. We gotta keep to keep it to the hits. <laughs> and look, Trump also didn't invent greed. Right? He is one of the many benefactors of it. Look, Obama did put Citibank in charge of his cabinet, and then he received over half a million dollars in speeches to Wall Street. Look, you don't get paid that much money to call them a bag of rotting cocks wrapped in pus covered <laughs> greed for an hour. <laughs> you just don't. Right? You get paid to be a celebrity smile, wave, and then say, good job, all your dads love you for like 30 minutes, right? <laughs> and that is the actual transcript from Obama's speeches. All of Wall Street's dads loved him, according to Obama. <laughs> but if you remember during this recent pandemic that we just had, both parties doled out money to help Wall Street while the American people had to wait for a month for a one-time payment of $1,200. And that was an agreement made behind closed doors with no representation from the people. Now, apparently, the meeting went till about 2 a.m., which is well past the bedline, bedtime of the average oppressor, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I like to go to bed at a, at, a, at a decent hour, you know? The, the early bird gets to slaves, you, you know, that old, age, old adage. <laughs> yeah. You guys remember that one? Did you guys learn that one at school? Now look, I, this, this meeting went on till the wee hours of the night. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they sealed this deal over like a blood orgy sponsored by Coca-Cola. <laughs> Yeah. And, and they all got a bottle with their names on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, that said Nancy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm only half sorry that you guys had to like picture uh, a blood orgy with Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi involved. Uh, but hey, I've been staring at this script for an entire week uh, and did that to myself too. So, you know, I only half feel bad. <laughs> Welcome to, welcome to my week. <laughs> so, sometimes I, I write things and then I regret them and I was like, man, maybe I'll share it with everybody. You know, that's something that I do. <laughs> <laughs> and look, we also have to remember that Trump didn't create poverty. He did redefine it though. You know, poverty in the income divide was growing larger and more cavernous for the past decade. And that's what happens when you leave the economy to a bunch of hucksters, fraudsters, cheats, liars, fuckwads, and tricksters. These two parties are one and the same. And if we can start from there, we can realize that voting blue, no matter who, won't work. We'll wind up seeing the same history start over again, right? If the, so if the Democrats lose, they'll go back to blaming Bernie Sanders, third parties, <laughs> You know, Russia, your mother, Russia's mother. 
and continue down this McCarthyist temper tantrum, like they're a spoiled teenager trying to celebrate their bat mitzvah quinceanera despite being white and Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> That one's not for you. <laughs> that one's not for you. And if they win, we'll have the same corporatist system as we did before, which will give rise to a, another fake populist billionaire to come in and say all the nice things that the working class wants to hear, only to treat them out of it at the very end. So why take a step backwards and repeat this vicious cycle of abuse again, right? How many times do we need to hear the hits Till we're sick of it. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty burned out to listening to Free Market Bird. <laughs> <laughs> song's too fucking long. Too yeah. fucking long. <laughs> so is this duopoly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the point with this duopoly, right? This duopoly has asked you to pick a color and drop your values. That's literally what vote blue no matter who is asking you to do. And you have to only pick between red or blue. I mean, for fuck's sake, guys, Crayola gives you more options than that. The, the, the Democratic Party, right? I mean, the Democratic Party claims to be for inclusion and diversity, but has forgot how diverse the color spectrum actually is. It's Roy G. Biv, not RB. You know, what about Oi Giv? Didn't think about those other letters, <laughs> did we? <laughs> Look, this is spectral discrimination, and I, for one, will not stand for it. Okay? <laughs> so, so, to me, why, not, why are we not building a system that allows for more options instead of narrowing the field down to two bands of color both representing corporate and private interests. Look, after 22 years of living in this country, uh, it, you know, America, or as I like to politely call it, the corporate states of United American Exceptionalism, sponsored by Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> after 22 years of living here, I, I finally got my citizenship. And this means that I finally have the right to vote. Now, the only reason I decided to do this and give up my Indian citizenship was to either vote for Tulsi Gabbard or Bernie Sanders. And because of the duopoly, the options are now down to two corporate warmongering, woman-hating, egotistic, walking flesh piles of narcissism that have never cared about me as a citizen or an, or an immigrant. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I refuse to vote for either of them. Now, I do have a bunch of lefties and liberals and progressives and family and friends telling me that I have to hold my nose and vote for the lesser of two evils. Well, here's the thing. Voting shouldn't be treated like it's a fish market. <laughs> yeah. You shouldn't hold your nose, make a decision, and then hope that that smell doesn't follow you home. It will, and it will linger for decades. And the whole country, <laughs> the whole country will smell like a rotting fish carcass. So good. Yeah. So voting for me, voting for me, and I think every other immigrant that had to fight through xenophobia, racism, and pay a bunch of money to ascertain the right to vote. This isn't something that we take lightly, and, and neither should you as citizens, as, as someone that has had this right and privilege to vote. Americans have this very passive and passing relationship with voting, right? Americans just pull a lever and feel like the job is done, and they can sit back and keep watching NCIS till the cows come home. <laughs> <laughs> Look. Well, they, ma they make it very easy. You can uh, ignore <laughs> politics the whole year and then choose one of the two colors and pull that switch. <laughs> that is true. But here, here's the thing. Voting uh, isn't a half-hearted hand job, okay? You can't, just, <laughs> you can't just get through it watching Scott Bakula keep New Orleans safe. Like, <laughs> oh, God. Oh. 
which the only reason I know that reference is because my mom watches NCIS New Orleans and Scott Bakula is on that show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it doesn't, it, it, voting means something, right? It, it's about making sure that your beliefs are represented by the person that you pull the lever for. It's like a full hearted hand job, you know? Like with the TV off and like way too much eye contact. <laughs> 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 it's like a hand job that means something. <laughs> Vote blue no matter who is just a kitschy way of saying give up who you actually are and be who we tell you to be. You know, it encourages you to be disassociated with politics, which influences your day to day life. Vote blue no matter who is an incredibly offensive idea and is what we should be fighting against. Instead of canceling each other, we should be canceling vote blue no matter who. <laughs> That's what we should cancel. So as an immigrant that finally has the right to vote bestowed onto him by a White House built by slaves, I gotta say, <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I gotta say, I'm, I'm not very ex excited to exercise this vote, right? Especially based on the awful candidate choices from the duopoly. But the process of voting in America might be more atrocious than the candidates we are told to vote for. <laughs> The voting process in America is so bad that when asked to describe this process, international election observers just showed a photo of a garbage can on fire. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah. now there's, a, there's a ton of ways that the American election system is fucked up. But in terms of the voters, a fair and balanced amount of fuckery happens right at the polls, particularly in the Democratic primaries. The voting system, the voting machines themselves are hijacked by a corporate interest that work with the Democratic National Committee, right, the DNC, uh, which is a private corporation that owns elections. So that basically means that we've privatized elections and turned it into a product, right? Get your votes here, get your votes, come on down. $5 gets you two Biden votes. $27 gets you a Bernie. <laughs> Come on down. $27 gets you a Bernie, but $5 gets you two Bidens. It's a Biden fire sale, folks. <laughs> <laughs> State of American elections. <clears throat> Look, in a, lot of, in a lot of states, the voting machines are owned by corporations, which have proprietary codes that only they can look at. In these states, the voter goes in, casts their choice, and then gets a printout of their choices with a barcode or a QR code. And then the only people who can access that QR code is the corporation that owns the voting machine. So there's no way for us to verify whether those votes got recorded the right way or not, right? Mm -hmm. So here is uh, here is someone that, that, that deals with this on a regular basis talking about that. So this is uh, Dr. Laura Chamberlain talking to Hardlands Media. This is a proprietary QR code that's owned by Dominion Voting System, the same electronic voting machine company that uh, programs their uh, electronic voting machines in Serbia. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? Okay. They have Serbia, Serbian um, programmers that put the code in. <laughs> These machines, you go up and you vote on them. It's like a big tablet, like your iPhone, but only bigger. You vote on them. It prints out a piece of paper. See, they got it that we've been saying paper ballot, paper ballot, paper ballot, okay. but they're super slick. So they, it prints up a piece of paper. It's just an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. Okay. Gets printed up. Your choices are right there. So it seems like, oh, look, my choices are here. President, you know, Bernie, uh, da, 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 you know, all your choices are printed up, but they also stamp a barcode, a proprietary barcode on that pa piece of paper. And that's what's counted. Not the, your choices printed up, mm -hmm. but this. And okay. this is, there's no way of knowing what's in here. There's no over-the-counter uh, machine How or insidious. smartphone app. Exactly. Okay. The Chicago Board of Elections even told me that they can't check and see what's in this barcode independently of the Dominion machines. Yeah. So basically, you voted for Bernie, but the machine is programmed to turn every third or fourth vote to Biden. 
And we can confirm a lot of this stuff uh, by exit polls, right? These are polls uh, taken to gather democratic, demographic information and make sure that the machine results uh, match the actual votes. And in most nations, if the exit polls show a 2% discrepancy, then the votes have to be recounted or redone entirely. In this election alone, we saw a lot of states that were showing over 8% discrepancy between Biden and Bernie votes. I mean, this is basically America looking at any authoritarian dictator and saying, fuck you, we can wreck our own democracy, baby. Okay? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> USA, USA. <laughs> I mean, guys, who needs Russians when you got the Democrats, right? We're gonna <laughs> with our own elections. And check this. This is this is the uh, this is the exit polls from uh, a lot of Super Tuesday states right here. So you can look. Uh, this is from Texas. Uh, you can see that the discrepancy between Bernie. And uh, uh, Bernie and Biden was 4.4%. Bernie and Bloomberg was 4.9%. So total, that's almost 9% discrepancy between, uh, between the exit polls and what was actually recorded by the machine. Massachusetts, right? Uh, Massachusetts was 8.4%, not just for Bernie, but also for Elizabeth Warren. So if you're a Warren supporter, Biden kind of fucked over Elizabeth Warren uh, with, with, this, uh, with, these, with these proprietary code machines too, right? It's the same thing, 10.2 for Bloomberg in Michigan, 7.5% uh, discre discrepancy there. So that's, seven, that's a little over 17%. That's, that's, that's so good, that's, that's almost 20% of the votes are, are just screwed, right? <laughs> Uh, here's South Carolina. This was a state that Biden uh, supposedly won in a landslide. 5.1% uh, uh, discrepancy between Biden and Bernie Sanders. That still doesn't mean that Biden would have won, but it doesn't mean it, it basically means that this this huge gap, uh, it, this huge thing that they were saying, oh, Biden, he's he's a, he's the ultimate winner because of South Carolina, is not exactly true because it wouldn't have been that big of a blowout. Uh, here's Missouri. Missouri was a Missouri was 9.6% uh, discrepancy. <laughs> uh, so this is, I mean, this is in in every other election that happens around the world, they would look at these results and say, "We got to fucking do it over, right?" But <laughs> but in America, we're like, "Let's just keep it. It's fine. We're just gonna go with it." So in 2016. This was this, what we just saw was happening in a bunch of different states, right? States like Arizona, Georgia, West Virginia, South Carolina, uh, and a bunch of other states. The exit polls were off anywhere between four and eight percent. And even the independent company that ran these exit polls basically said uh, that they released these numbers and then they adjusted them, quote unquote, adjusted them to fit machine results. This isn't just election fraud. This is mismanagement of mathematics, which is a fundamental universal constant, okay? <laughs> so really what the Democratic Party is doing should be a crime against the universe. That's how bad this is. <laughs> These people shouldn't be allowed anywhere near numerals for the next 500 years. <laughs> And, and when the DNC and their partner corporations are called out for cheating the American people, they responded with that they don't owe any fairness to anybody. They said that in a court of law that they are allowed to and will continue to cheat in order to win. And these are the Democrats, right? These are the people that we believe are the good guys. Well, the good guys just claimed that they have the right to cheat democracy. They said that in front of, they said all of this in front of a judge. In front of a judge, they said that they're allowed to have an electoral cabal, which, let's be honest, kind of sounds like the lamest of all cabals, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the Republicans are, 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 don't have their hands clean of the situation either. They've instated things like gerrymandering and interstate cross-check, cross which, uh, interstate cross-check specifically in general elections ensures that voters with the same last name will be kicked off the count. Now this primarily affects minority voters uh, and if they have to sacrifice a couple of Smiths 
and Jones is along the way, so be it, you guys. <laughs> so be it. Yeah. Yeah, they will, they will be sacrificial lambs for the Republicans' electoral cabal, which is just as lame as the Democrats. Right? So who says, who says the duopoly can't achieve equality? You know, they just, they're both equally lame and worthless. You know, there it is. <laughs> Boom. There's that equality. <laughs> we were all looking for it. It was right there. <laughs> so, and the Democrats and Republicans are so proud of the way that they manipulate American democracy that they are ready to ship it to all other nations, right? That's, that's what happens when you privatize democracy. You, you start packaging it, you know? Maybe Banana Republic isn't just about selling boring ass shirts to boring ass people, but also boring ass elections to countries that don't fucking need it. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> but this is the basis for every war we wage across the world, right? America claims to bring democracy by way of the American military, which is basically the electoral equivalent of Shia LaBeouf yelling, do it. <laughs> do it! <laughs> Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. This is literally, <laughs> this is literally the equi equivalent of a shotgun wedding between democracy and countries that aren't sure what this democracy is and why it keeps yelling at them. <laughs> oh, no! So just do it! Make your dreams come true! Just do it! <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> that is one of the most encouraging one-minute videos uh, that you'll find anywhere on the internet. It's, it's great. <laughs> like, if you ever feel down, just look up this video and just have Shia LaBeouf yelling at you for a minute. And you're like, yeah, why am I not doing something? Like, I should do anything <laughs> but this. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's just so oh, impressive. God. It's, it is, he's a very special person. Uh, but anyway. Now, uh, one of, America's newest targets of uh, our democracy exports is Venezuela, right? And look, Venezuela doesn't need our version of democracy because they have one of the fairest and best rated elections in the world. And, and Jimmy Carter even said that, <laughs> right? So this is what they do. Um, they use a mix of paper ballots, biometrics, and machine voting to ensure fairness in the election process. America that bringing them democracy would be like the US offering mayo as a spice to India. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. Oh. Oh. Listen, that shit is offensive and it will spark World War III. <laughs> <laughs> we will burn so many things to the ground. This whole process, by the way, I, I've watched this video a bunch of different times. The only way that you can like steal the election in Venezuela is not only if you hack the machines, but you literally have to run in there and stuff a bunch of votes into that ballot box itself. Like that's the only way you can do it. It's it's a it's a very, very tightly run system over there. Right. Now, as poet laureates, uh, the Wu Tang clan have said, cash rules everything around me. You guys remember the, the beautiful poem that they, they sang? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Look, elections are no different, right? Most politicians are not working on policies to better the lives of their constituents, states, districts, et cetera, et cetera, right? They spend most of their time fundraising. It's roughly between 30 and 70% of the time fundraising. And then the, the rest of the time, uh, what they're doing is that they are uh, reenacting their favorite scenes from NCIS and performative politics. So, very exciting. <laughs> very exciting. Chuck Schumer pretends to be Scott Bakula. It's, it's hilarious, you guys. It's, a, it's, it's very good use of tax dollars, I think. <laughs> 
Now, here's the thing. The most that you can donate to a candidate is $5,200, right? Which in 2016 came from about 400 families or 57,854 individuals. That's roughly 0.2% of the population that contributed to over half the finances of political campaigns in 2016. Look, if you can contribute $5,200 to various candidates and still have money left over for a jet ski, you are basically a political pimp and these politicians are your bottom bitches. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And look, if you're offended by that terminology and not the robbery of our election process, you're not getting the fucking point. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> <Ice. laughs> yeah. Now, a Princeton study showed that there is a rising correlation between legislation that is passed with the viewpoints of the economic elites, right? Basically, what that means is the more that the elites want something to happen, the more likely it will happen. The same thing with these interest groups as well. But when it comes to the viewpoints of the people, there is a flat line, meaning no matter how much consensus there is amongst the people, the likelihood of this legislation passing on our behalf stays the same. Yeah. And that's done by Princeton, which is, uh, which is a pretty, pretty like little neoliberal school there, right? But this idea right here is where the notion of partisanship comes from, right? The Democrats like to blame the Republicans and vice versa for not getting things done. And the people that have more allegiances to these parties than each other start quibbling about which master is kinder in their oppression. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But the reality is that both parties don't care about the people and only listen to the donor class. This is, this is not just a duopoly. This is a monopoly. This is one snake with two heads. This is proof that we're living in a democracy for fundraising, right? This is proof that we're living in a kleptocracy, which is a fancy word for a stolen democracy, which is a very nice way of saying trash fire. <laughs> <laughs> And there have even been instances where both parties have been far more blatant about their allegiances to the donors and the delegates. Oh, that's right. Our election process in America involves delegates that choose the candidate. Supposedly, they do this based on the people's voices. But really, what it does is make the voting system even bigger of a clusterfuck. You know? The delegate process is like this, right? It's like, uh, it's like ordering from the drive through menu. Right? You go into the drive-thru, you said you wanted a veggie burger with a chocolate milkshake and a side of fries. But instead what you get is a literal garbage fire. <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is it's a guy, I don't know if you know this, it's very dangerous to have in your car. Is is just a whole trash can <laughs> on fire. Not safe, <laughs> you guys. Unsafe. Look, in, in 1912, Republican candidate Teddy Roosevelt wanted to push back against the corporate direction of the Republican Party. Nine out of 13 primary states chose Roosevelt, but Taft was nominated to the party instead. And that's because Taft went directly to the delegates because he knew that they'd be making the decision anyway. So this eventually led to the creation of the Bull Moose Party, which we'll talk about the, uh, that in a little bit. Right. In 1968, uh, the, Hubert Humphrey was selected as the Democratic nominee uh, after he campaigned in, uh, this is a record number here, zero fucking states. None. He didn't campaign <laughs> in any of them. <laughs> right. And the Democratic Party basically chose Hubert Humphrey to be their candidate of choice. And, uh, and, and then basically what happened is that the people realized that their votes did matter. Uh, and then there was a fucking riot, you guys. <laughs> there was a fucking riot, right? So this is, this is uh, uh, where did we go from here? Oh, I, I accidentally doubled up on that slide. Okay. In 1968, Hubert Humphrey ended up with the nomination for Democratic the Democratic nomination for president, 
without running in a single primary. So it's the same thing that happened with Taft, who was president and didn't run in a single, you know, he ran, but, but Roosevelt ended up winning in the popular states and Taft was able to throw his weight around with the other states and get the nomination because he was all establishment. Well, in 1968, it was worse. Hubert Humphrey didn't even run in the primaries. He said, why do I need to run in the primaries? All I got to do is win over the delegates. This created a riot. This was in the Chicago Convention of 1968. <laughs> yeah. So here's what the Democrats did, right? They had to get the faith of the people back. So the Democrats let the populist, uh, oh, the populists, uh, us, we the people, pick the nominee. So in 1972, they chose George McGovern, who was an anti-war left-wing populist. And in response to that, the DNC tanked his campaign against Nixon by running smear campaigns and pushing Democrats for Nixon. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, <laughs> hey, we got to vote blue no matter who, right? Eesh. Yeah. If you ever needed proof that there was only one party in this country, it's in the reality of fucking Democrats for Nixon. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is Kim, Kim Iverson. George McGovern, that. who was an anti war progressive candidate, um, ended up. Uh, getting the nomination by popular vote. And the Democratic Party did what we're seeing today with Bernie Sanders. They went on a major media campaign to smear the guy. And they did this in 1972 to George McGovern. There was actually a movement of Democrats that came out saying Democrats for Nixon. They wanted Nixon over George McGovern. And they actually campaigned on behalf of Nixon. I don't know if you caught that last little pin, but it did say uh, putting country over party. <laughs> 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 Choosing Richard Nixon was putting country over party, according to the Democrats, uh, in uh, in 1972. That's fun. That's a that's a fu that's a fun part of our history. <laughs> Look, this this version of democracy should be left behind. Right? It's controlled, it's manipulated, and it doesn't work for the people it claims to represent. It does work for profit and the donor class. And what we need is something better. What we need to do is throw this version of democracy in the trash and light it on fucking fire. <laughs> That's what we need to do. In our car. In our, yeah, no, don't, not in the car. <laughs> no, leave the, take it out of your vehicle. All fires should be taken out of vehicles. Uh, look, we got. If we're going to have a revolution, there there have to be safety measures involved. I'm I'm going to be that guy in the revolution. I'm going to be the guy that's like, hey, that doesn't look safe. Do you want to maybe set it on fire outside the building? That's going to set off the fire alarms. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be that guy. But with the privatization of of our election system. Uh, it's become way more evident that we need a whole brand new system to be put into place. And one of the options that's being discussed right now is rank choice voting or what's called an instant runoff voting. This system looks for a true majority in the election system, which uh, if you don't know what a true majority is, that's, that's somebody with at least 51% of the votes, right? Now, rank choice voting can sound complicated, and it is if you're only using about two neurons at a time, which is also called the duopoly of neurons. <laughs> <laughs> because it's equally stupid. <laughs> so, but really it's not as hard as people think, right? Especially if you have multiple candidates running, you select which candidate is your number one choice, your number two choice, and so on. Uh, and if there's a candidate that you'd never ever vote for, then, then you just don't pick them, period. It's kind of awesome. You get the choice to do that. Right, so ranked choice voting then goes through rounds of voting. Uh, all of the number one choices are counted. Then the candidate with the least amount is eliminated. And then all of their votes are redistributed amongst the rest of the candidates. And this is where the ranking system comes into play. Right, The redistribution is based on who was their number two choice. And then we repeat this until we reach a true majority. In most cases with ranked choice voting, it, it never goes past the second or third round. It's very rare that it goes into a fourth or fifth round, right? But a lot of corporate candidates don't like this system 
because it's not about the donor class. It also means that they'd have to reach out to voters who are not in their base. So it would mean Democrats talking to conservatives in the middle of the country and not calling them a basket of deplorables or conservative cuck magnets. <laughs> you can't do that anymore. <laughs> It would also mean that Republicans have to talk to liberals without calling them libtards and snowflakes. And, and this one's going to be a tough one for, for me. It's going to mean that progressives and independent candidates are going to have to talk to neoliberals without calling them corporate chills. That's going to be hard. <laughs> That's going to be really hard. <laughs> now, I know this sounds like this is going to be like a much longer election process than we already have. But in reality, it would mean that we can have the same length for the electoral process, but make it a lot more worthwhile, right? The debates would be about discussing ideas and why they're valuable to the people of varying belief systems. And instead of each candidate trying to dunk on each other to see who can get the soundbite of the week, which is basically what our debates are now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The claim is that this is a less democratic process, right? Because it doesn't choose an instant winner. But that's also kind of false because ranked choice voting is far more democratic because it means that people's voices actually matter in the election system, right? It doesn't force you to make a choice between the lesser of two evils, which I will remind you is still voting for evil. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we should, right. yeah, really fucking stop doing that, right? Voting for lesser, <laughs> of two, we should, yeah, voting for lesser of two evils is like the real version of when your friend asks, "Hey, gun to your head," and then says the stupidest fucking thing you've ever heard. <laughs> right? It's always gun to your head, dumb comment, right? It's like I don't want to choose between getting kicked in the balls and directly inside my asshole. <laughs> See, this is why we don't invite you to things, Randy. Okay? <laughs> making it weird. <laughs> Look, making the lesser of two evils argument is like having two people with guns to your head and asking you to choose which bullet are you willing to take. Right? And look, I get, I get that that's an extreme example, but voting for evil is a pretty extreme decision to make. <laughs> so I feel pretty justified by that. <laughs> right? But ranked choice voting eliminates that argument. Ranked choice voting makes us more involved in our politics. You have to know what each candidate stands for and why they are the particular number choice. We become a more informed populace this way. It encourages conversations with people of differing ideologies because our leaders are doing it too. It no longer means that we have a passive relationship with politics and voting, right? This is the full hearted hand job that we talked about earlier. <laughs> you know, that's what this is. Eye contact. Lots of eye contact, <laughs> frankly, is voting. <laughs> There's so much eye contact, you guys. <laughs> it's, you, you're really staring deep into people's eyes during ranked choice voting. It's pretty nice. Pretty nice. Uh, George Mc... Oh, there we go. Uh, so the other thing, too, with ranked choice voting is that it's a lot harder to manipulate election results. Uh, a, like, for example, in 2002, during the Irish general elections, they counted over 16,000 pattern variations for 44,000 voters. Now, obviously, the drawback is that, uh, you know, this is going to take longer to count the votes. Uh, and that's okay, because this is voting and not a drive through where you get something that barely passes for food. Well, I feel like it should take a little bit longer. And that's fine. <laughs> so, and this is the thing, it's like Ireland's not the only country uh, with ranked choice voting. We have Australia, New Zealand, Sri Lanka, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Estonia. A lot of EU countries have chosen to use this as their form of democracy. 
in America, cities like Minneapolis are using it, right? Maine, the state of Maine has been using it for their elections. And even states like North Carolina have used it for judicial elections. Now they get rid of it when they realize that people are gaining a little bit more power and money becomes meaningless in an election. So they have to get rid of it. Now, some people have called ranked choice voting a gimmick, right? But what they fail to see is, uh, is how a photo op with a Bible is a gimmick, right? Or, or, bringing, <laughs> yeah. or bringing a snowball into Congress to disprove climate change is a gimmick. Or pretending you care about black people by wearing African garb is a gimmick. Uh, yeah. Oh, did you guys not know? The Democrats said Wakanda forever and now racism is solved. Did you guys? <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Yeah, did you guys not get that message? That's what, <laughs> that's what that was all about. <laughs> you know? Look, ranked choice voting isn't a gimmick. Our current voting system that leads to performative politics is. That's the fucking gimmick. Ranked choice voting lets you vote with your beliefs intact. It also shows the diversity of beliefs and how many pattern variations you have within these rankings, right? This encourages us to be a more understanding, intelligent, and compassionate about our ideas. We vote for ideas rather than mascots who just keep touting whether they're winners or losers. But a key aspect of making ranked choice voting work is having more than two parties. Actually, you know what? In America, it would be great if we had two parties. That'd be fun. Uh, but yeah, but as we discussed earlier, uh, they're both the parties of money, and both parties were for Nixon's racist drug war. Also, his racist regular war. They were for that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But in America, the so-called third parties, like the Green Party, the Libertarian, and even the Socialist Party are called spoilers, right? They're called spoilers. But I've never found this to make any sense, right? Calling third parties spoilers has always been this weird, odd thing to me. Because not once, not once have they given away the ending to a Marvel movie. Like, not. <laughs> you know? I waited fucking three days to watch Avengers Endgame and not one libertarian or Green Party or socialist gave away the ending. And I, there were a couple neoliberals that were like, hey, did you see that part where Cap picks up Thor's hammer? It's like, God, well, God damn it. God damn it, Joe Biden. Stay son off Twitter. Of, you son of a bitch, I know. But not, <laughs> once, not one socialist did it because they respect art, <laughs> so. But, you know, these third parties, they do represent the end of a corporate monopoly of the American election dumpster fire. So I guess in that way, they are kind of like a spoiler, you know? They're, they're like the spoiler to a dying empire, you know? And spoiler alert, it's, uh, it's gonna die. It is gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess I'll, I'll log off. Right. <laughs> we, we did it, you guys. <laughs> but here's the thing, right? Without a third party, the Republican Party wouldn't actually exist because they were, in fact, a third party, right? The Whigs and the Democrats were not listening to party members uh, who didn't want to see slavery in their society anymore. So what did they do? they decided to break off and move in a completely different direction. So in 1854, uh, the Whigs and a bunch of uh, various members of uh, uh, you know, other fringe parties decided to start the process of creating their own new party. The straw that broke the camel's back, as you can see here, is, was the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which wanted to make sure that Kansas and Nebraska were slave states. Uh, the members of the Whigs were opposed to more slave states but when the leadership disagreed, it gave birth to the Republican Party. Their first state convention was in Jackson, Michigan in 1854. 
And then in 1856, their first national convention was in my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. They didn't even try to organize in the Southern states. Can you imagine the Republicans didn't even organize in the Southern states because they didn't think that they could win down there. So to recap, the reason why the Republican Party was created was to fight against slavery and formed in Northern working class cities. They stood against slavery. They were for expanding the banks, higher tariffs on the rich, and free land to farmers. Yeah, that's right, guys. They were farming socialists. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. Oh, can you guys hear that noise? Yeah, that noise is uh, the sound of every Republican's heart bursting at the knowledge of that. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're all exploding at the same time. <laughs> now, this was the party of Lincoln, right? This is why Lincoln even won in the first place. And when he did, he gave this bombastic speech, right? In his speech, he says, when you speak of us Republicans, you do so only to denounce us as reptiles or at the best as no better than outlaws. You will grant a hearing to pirates or murderers, but nothing like it to black Republicans. Wow but you will not abide by the election of a Republican president. In that supposed event, you will say you will destroy the union. And then you say the great crime of having uh, destroyed it will be upon us. That is cool. A highwayman holds a pistol to my ear and mutters through his teeth, stand and deliver or I shall kill you. Then you will be a murderer. <laughs> yeah. That's a bombastic ass speech right there. <laughs> Lincoln is basically calling out the spoiler argument in 1860, right? It was a bullshit argument 160 years ago, and it's a bullshit argument now, right? So, so what the hell happened to the Republican Party, right? They, they seemed far more progressive in 1854 than in 1954, and probably also in 2054, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's be honest. If they continue on the same trajectory that they are on right now, the Republicans might just turn into the national KKK super Hitler party. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh no. <laughs> That's the line we're in. So here's what happened, right? After uh, Lincoln's assassination, the party had grown and there were two factions. There were the radicals and the moderates. Sounding familiar? Right. By the time President Grant was in office in 1868, the radical Republicans, which is a super weird thing to say out loud. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the radical Republicans were in control, right? Uh, these guys were forming unions, mobilizing voters in the South, and they were fighting off the KKK. Yeah. Guys, you heard me correctly the Republicans were fighting the KKK, right? So with that knowledge, the next time one of these whitewashed modern Republicans claims to be the party of Lincoln, ask them when was the last time they broke up a Klan rally or kicked David Duke directly in the dick. <laughs> <laughs> If the answer is never, then they're not the party of Lincoln, right? Really, Republicans, modern Republicans anyway, should, should definitely not compare themselves to the Republicans of the yesteryears. Or the nickname I like for them is the Afro Klan Hunters. I think that's, <laughs> that's a fun nickname for the Republicans of 1868. <laughs> so by 18... 72, there were at least, at least seven black Republican congressmen from Southern states, right? As you can see, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, Florida, fucking Florida. Holy shit, Florida got something right. <laughs> That's crazy. And this, this happened despite the fact that the South was particularly difficult for the Republicans to gain a massive foothold and become a biracial party. They were having a really, really hard time. But this fact right here is what brings us to the subject 
of Confederate statues. Look, this is where I draw the line, right? 1871. If you get up to 1871, if you build a statue before 1871, fine. Fucking keep it up, right? I'll leave it alone. Leave your loser ass heritage alone. That's fine, right? If it's after 1872, it's not heritage. It's you being a massive dick and the sorest of all fucking losers. That's what you are. If you really want this to be a part of your heritage and you build a statue after 1872, then your Republican heritage should include every single one of these radical black Republicans. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So here's where the trouble begins. In the 1880s, the Republicans were starting to lose steam because of German and Irish Catholic immigrants who were supporting the Democrats a lot more and also the fact that the Republicans became sober. They were a dry party. They didn't like booze, right? Now, I think this is probably where the anti-immigrant rhetoric comes from. But here's the thing. I don't remember shit on immigrants being part of the 12-step program. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> So the Republicans started calling the Democrats the party of rum, Romanism, and rebellion, right? Rum because the Democrats were linked to tavern keepers, Romanism because of the Irish Roman Catholics, and rebellion to remind folks that they were trying to break up the Union during the Civil War. <laughs> That's what they were trying to do. So by the time of the McKinley administration, which I believe was 1896, 1898, somewhere within there, the Republican starting party starts becoming the party we see today, right? President McKinley vowed to decrease tariffs and develop a partnership with big business like rail companies. Now, with that in mind, he promoted the idea of plural, pluralism. It's a very hard word to say, uh, which basically means that he was aiming to get prosperity for all by the first version of trickle-down economics, which is an idea that would go on to fail for over a hundred goddamn years. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. It fails so much, you guys. <laughs> so William McKinley went for the money and started transforming the Republican Party into the party of privatization. So really, modern, McKin modern Republicans are the party of McKinley who was assassinated and they should all take note of that. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing, the Republican Party itself is responsible for the birth of America's, one, one of America's you know, most famous third parties besides itself, of course, right? In 1901, Teddy Roosevelt became president and by the end of his term, he saw what the party was becoming and, uh, and he started denouncing it. So Teddy goes on to say, uh, again and again in my public career, I have had to make head against mob spirit, against the tendency of poor, ignorant, and turbulent people who feel a rancorous jealousy and hatred for those who are better off. But during the last few years, it has been the wealthy corruptionists of enormous fortune and of enormous influence through their agents of the press, pulpit, college, and public life with whom I've waged a bitter war. Yeah. Hmm. Teddy Roosevelt uh, turned out to be a kind of cool dude uh, with a somewhat large forehead. So... <laughs> <laughs> so that led... Teddy Roosevelt uh, to, to create the Blue Moose Party, right? As we mentioned earlier, William Howard Taft uh, was chosen to become the Republican nominee despite Teddy Roosevelt winning nine out of 13 states in the 1912 election. He was so disillusioned by the system that he created the progressive Bull Moose Party of 1912. He ran on a square deal, which had three goals, conservation of natural resources, control of corporations and consumer protection. I mean, he's already outlefted most modern Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just with he those did. three statements alone. Mm -hmm. Now, he also wanted to dissolve 
the unholy alliance between corporate business and corporate politics. Guys, Teddy realized that only the devil could come up with an alliance between business and politics, right? Only the devil would enact an idea as fiendish as math manipulation. Only the devil could make evil so fucking boring, right? That rascal. Yeah, right? I mean, <laughs> guys, look at what God was doing. You know, God was sending his kid down to turn water into wine. That's a party move right there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That dude knew how to throw down. He was walking on water. What? That's some David Blaine shit. <laughs> you know? He was raising people from the dead. It's like nobody's ever done that before. Right? And here's another thing that he did. He punched bankers directly in the dick. That's very exciting. Stuff. <laughs> That's super exciting. He hate Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. A lot of people don't talk about that, but he definitely he definitely got some uppercuts to the nads. You know, that's not in the book. That's left for interpretation, and that's how I interpret it. <laughs> in my head, he ducks, and then it's a lot of uppercuts to the nads. That's what it is. <laughs> so It's probably in the Bible. It's probably in there, right? Yeah, <laughs> open to interpretation. But this is where the unholiness comes from, right? Those bankers are now making legislation to fuck over the working class and blatantly overusing words like here too and thou. Like, it's too much. It's too much. Speak English, bankers. That's what I got to say. So in 1912, the Bull Moose Party took 20% of the votes. They tied with the Republicans. Unfortunately, uh, the party didn't last, right? The party disbanded, mostly because its members wanted to win instead of drive real change. But 1912 was a pretty big year for new parties because the Socialist Party of America was also taking hold at the same time. In 1912, Eugene Victor Debs was running for president under the Socialist Party of America. There, there are some folks who consider Bernie Sanders to be the Eugene Debs of today. But that isn't really true, right? In 1884, back in 1884, Debs was elected to the Indiana House of Representatives. He was a union man, right? And henceforth, he introduced a lot of bills to help the families of injured rail workers. He gave riveting speeches that led to these bills passing in the House, but then left to die in the Democrat-controlled Senate. Debs did not, did not run for the House again because he saw the Democratic Party for what it was, a corrupt, soulless party that is willing to let its people die for money. That's what he knew about them in 1884. Debs left the party. Bernie did not. Bernie tried to reform the party from within but Debs realized that the party is unwilling to reform. He saw that over a hundred years before Bernie Sanders. But Bernie wants to be liked by the Democratic Party, and the reality is that they're, they're never, they're never going to like him. Right? They've spent the better part of this decade alone demonizing him and his flagship ideas. Right? Bernie has become that nerd that desperately tries to win the friendship of the jocks only to get tackled over and over and over. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's a reality we need to face, that Bernie Sanders is no Eugene Debs. And uh, this is uh, Chris Hedges, who I don't recommend if you're, if you're looking for hope. Uh, this is Chris Hedges talking about Bernie Sanders and his need to be liked by the uh, uh, the party. And Shama pushed Bernie before the event. I was there as to why he wouldn't run as an independent, arguing correctly that we were never going to build an effective political movement in an election cycle, and we were not going to build it within the confines of the Democratic Party. Sanders' answer 
was that he didn't want to become Ralph Nader. Uh, what did that mean? What does it mean? Nader ran for president several times. He actually did quite well in 2000, uh, getting almost 5% of the vote. The Democratic Party had to destroy him. They were terrified. I was Nader's speechwriter. And they did. They turned him into a pariah. Uh, and that's what Sanders meant. He knew the Democratic Party machine would destroy him. Uh, they would uh, mount uh, an intensive campaign to deny him his Senate seat. That's you know what they did to McGovern. People forget George McGovern, our last, the last Democratic nominee to take on the military-industrial establishment. He didn't want to be Ralph Nader. So back to Debs, right? Uh, Eugene Debs left politics, and then he went on to start the American Railway Union, and then he led the Pullman strikes of 1894. This was one of the many times that the American military was called to fire upon its own citizens to break up strikes, right? In order to prevent a general strike, which would have been a peaceful protest, the American military, under the order of the Insurrection Act, used its force, killed 30 strikers, injuring 57 others, and causing $80 million dollars worth of damage in 1894, $80 million in 1894. Now, you know how like when you were kids, you know, your parents would like, if you're like roughing around in the back of the car, like your parents would be like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna turn this car around, you bastards. You know, like, you know, when you're trying, <laughs> yeah. If you like didn't show up, they're like, oh, we're gonna turn this car around. <laughs> Calling the military to shut down general strikes is basically the government's version of that. But instead of going home, it's like if your parents ran your car into a Walmart and then blamed the <laughs> kids for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's basically what they did in, in, in 1894, right? The rich railroad tycoons used a bunch of their media propaganda to turn the public against unions, blaming them for the damage, blaming them for the, de de the debt, and then they put Debs on trial, right? After, and then he was put into prison for six months under conspiracy charges. Yeah. After, he was, uh, after he was released uh, in, in uh, 19, 1900, uh, he created the Socialist Party of America and ran for president five times, ran five times. His goal was to create a system that would empower workers and reduce militarism in America. So he challenged capitalism at every turn, at every turn. And he pointed out how the Democratic Party is not really for the progressive. Right? He goes on to say, the radical and the progressive elements of the former democracy have been ev evicted and must seek quarters. They were an unmitigated nuisance in the conservative councils of the old party. They were for the common people, and the trusts have no use for such a party. Where but to the socialist party can these progressive people turn? Every true Democrat should thank Wall Street for driving them out of a party that is democratic in name only and into one that is democratic in fact. Bam. How about bombastic. that for some fucking bombastic speeches, huh? <laughs> Here's why Eugene Debs might be better than me is because he didn't say fuck once in that at all. <laughs> Not even once. <laughs> So in 1911, leading up to his run against Woodrow Wilson, uh, by the way, he had a he had a train that he he rode around called the Red Special, is what he called it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, 1908 to 1911, he ran his campaigns on the Red Special. Um, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, so leading up to his run, this is he he said this right. He said we should seek to only register the actual vote of socialism, no more, no less. In our propaganda, we should state our principles clearly, speak the truth fearlessly, seeking neither to flatter nor to offend, but only to convince those who should be with us and win them to our cause through an intelligent understanding 
of its mission. Socialism must be organized, drilled, equipped, and the place to begin is in the industries where the workers are employed. So like I said, he wanted, he wanted to empower the workers. He was literally the first true candidate that was running as an organizer in chief. In 1912, he got 1 million votes. That was 6%. He got 6% of the votes. He got no national attention, attention and was virtually a nobody in the political arena. And he still got 6% percent of the votes. In 1918, at age 63, after giving an anti-war speech, he was in, imprisoned under the Espionage Act, which if you don't know what the Espionage Act is, that's the reason Julian Assange is still in prison, right? And in 1918, the big tough American war machine was afraid of an elderly socialist in a top hat. <laughs> So, okay, so I know some of you guys are like, Chris, you're being kind of hard. What did he say in his speech? You know, what was the 1918 speech all about? So in that speech, Deb points out the only, only the rich make war and decide the terms of the peace. The middle class who would fight these wars don't get to be involved in that process, which we don't. When was the last time an average iron worker was invited to any of the treaties of Paris? Right. Right. Yes. And really, when you think about it, when was the last time that you heard the word treaty in our lexicon? <laughs> <laughs> the answer to that question is 1898, you guys. That's the last time. Uh, we've Since then, we've pretty much replaced the word treaty with submit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. Oh, dear. Now, after Eugene Debs' speech pointed out how the middle class has been cannon fodder for the arms industry in battle for imperialistic control of power and resources, Debs was sentenced to three 10-year prison sentences and had his right to vote revoked. This is basically the origin of the prison industrial complex, right? Mm -hmm. We don't treat prisoners like they're people. We treat them like they're turncoats in a revolution against nothing. Now, he ran for president again from prison in 1920, and he got another 6% of the votes. Imagine how well he would have done if he was not a political prisoner, you know, riding around on the red special out there. <laughs> During his time in the Atlanta penitentiary, he was a major, major advocate for prison reform because he saw firsthand what was happening. He was liked so much by the prisoners that when he got out, the prisoners made him a hand-carved cane. That's how much they liked him. So, in, in 1912, 6% of the people rejected the Democratic Party. And again, in 1920, 6% of the people rejected the Democratic Party. In 1912, 20% of the people rejected the Republican Party. So over a quarter of the country rejected the duopoly over a hundred years ago. So why is it that Americans can't do that a century later? America is taught to be a, a country of winners Right? Going against the American way of exceptionalism and the corporate duopoly is you're, you're called a loser. That's what you're called in, in the system. And the reason why we choose to vote to win rather than vote our beliefs is because we have an election system that says that you don't matter unless you're the winner. But voting against your beliefs means that you've already lost. Our passive relationship with voting makes us forget that life is political. Healthcare, race relations, immigrations, all of that affects how you feed your family, your health, and your job. So if you don't engage in politics, then you don't engage in life. And if we wanna win, we have to burn our apathy 
in the trash and support the fight for a brand new system. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. I appreciate it. Yeah. And that is your forkful of noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a share. Please give it a thumbs up and share it around and make sure that you're subscribed to this channel. Uh, this channel often gets suppressed because we don't particularly talk about things that uh, that the algorithm deems is cool. <laughs> so uh, we depend on, uh, uh, or I depend on you guys uh, sharing it out to as many people as you possibly can. Um, there's going to be a bunch of cool stuff coming up on this channel. Uh, videos like this, more scripted history-based socio-political commentary. Uh, there's rantier videos about uh, current events, news. There, there's more uh, bite-sized videos about uh, specific topics. And there's going to be interviews coming up on this channel as well that I'm excited to share with you guys. So uh, there's going to be a bunch of cool stuff coming up on this channel. Uh, virtually every single day of the week, you can probably find some videos coming up on this channel. So make sure you're subscribed to that. Uh, and like I mentioned at the very top of the show, this was recorded in front of a, a, a live virtual audience. So if you would like to be part of a live virtual audience, you can totally do so by purchasing tickets and, uh, and coming out to, to hang out with us and, and take part in the Citizen Revolution live virtual stand-up comedy shows. Uh, they happen on Fridays um, and uh, at 9 p.m. They're only five bucks and we donate half the proceeds to, uh, to a grassroots organization venue journalists etc etc so uh and this video that you're watching right now we donated half the ticket sales to a movement for a people's party uh so if you would like to learn even more about them if you would like to donate to them you can do so at peoplesparty.org the link is in the description below uh and uh, i hope to see you guys at one of these events i hope you guys will go grab your tickets go to krishmohan.com for those tickets it's k-r-i-s-h m-o-h-a-n become a sustaining make member make a one-time donation buy an album go nuts with watching a bunch of these videos go crazy about it uh but krishmohan.com is your one-stop shop for all things krishmohan uh i hope to see you guys again soon thanks for tuning in and we'll